Um, my first 22 years of life uh, were spent in the bounds of the Clinch Mountain District, and that's why I thought that I might be interested in sharing some of my story tonight. I've not shared this with the group yet, um, but y'all are home folks, and I wanted to um, do that. Um, my church was Elk Garden, and I, I clearly remember being told uh, as a child um, and having to do a little bit of history stuff in the fourth grade that the church has a balcony because that's where the slaves sat uh, during worship. So I kind of grew up knowing some of that history, but it, you know, as a child, it doesn't quite register like it does now. My elementary school was Elk Garden, the now home of the wonderful Outreach Center. Um, and my high school was Lebanon High School. My college was Emory and Henry. So I am a child of that uh, geographic area for sure and was formed there. Um, my high school became integrated about halfway through my time there. Um, it was kind of a big deal in, in Lebanon, uh, in the newspapers, and I heard adults talking about it. From, from my mother, I had uh, a role model of the most gracious hospitality. So whoever passed the road and stopped at our house was invited to come on the porch and visit. And we spent a lot of time on that porch visiting. I learned hospitality from her. And from my pastors, one of whom is on this Zoom meeting, um, and from Sunday school teachers, I had learned a lot about Jesus. I had grown to love Jesus and his ways of embracing people, and I believed in him. And I believed I should act like he did. So I knew my role in that much anticipated day and year of integration was to be gracious, welcoming, and kind. And I did my best to live that out. But Russell County had few black residents. Likewise, Emory and Henry had very few um, students of color. And my seminary, even though it was located in the middle of Atlanta, which was I would stand at the drugstore where I worked and just look out on the world and think, my gosh, this is mind blowing for, our, for a Russell County girl. And, and yet my seminary was, was predominantly white, very few students of color. So my world uh, was very white for, for much, most of that time. Um, I did have the privilege of being ordained by Bishop Allen that Pete talked about. But I did not consider myself to be prejudiced. Um, and then um, my husband and I decided to adopt children. And um, it was mind blowing to go through the interviews uh, with VHS where you had to go through every physical characteristic, color of eyes, color of hair, all every physical characteristic imaginable to check if you would accept a child with that characteristic. And I was broken heart. I went home and sobbed. And the, the hardest part was that the two categories, there are only two categories for adoption. And one was healthy white infant and one was hard to place. So you were either healthy white infant or hard to place. And um, in this process, we discovered that uh, the cler clergy friends of ours were fostering for Holston Home and they had an infant girl who was biracial in their home. She was, she was brand new to the world. Um, and we knew she would be hard to place. And we checked with Holston Home and there were no families waiting who were willing to have a, a biracial child. And so we began to work with that process and to pursue it within ourselves, within Larry and I talking and, and praying and discerning, could we do this? Should we do this? Is this the thing for us? And are we the people for her? 
And um, while we, we decided we, we were, you know, people are very eager to tell you all the roadblocks and all the reasons you shouldn't do this and all the reasons that it'll be bad for the child down the road. Ultimately, we made the decision that we would, would welcome her into our home because we had visited <laughs> um, our friends. And once I ever looked in the eyes of that little girl, I knew I wanted her to be mine. But I went through this discovery and I, I'll have to be perfectly honest with you. I found out what implicit bias is because I um, had this vision and, and those of you who've been to Elk Garden School know those steps that come down. Um, they're, they're long steps and, and I had always envisioned, uh, had this vision in my head of my little girl coming down those steps into my arms after school, even though I knew I wouldn't live there. That's the vision which we all have before we ever have children. And um, I couldn't get that vision of my daughter being a little black girl coming down to fit and be okay. And so I had to go to work. I found out there were things that I had absorbed from my culture that were in my heart that I didn't know about, didn't know they were there. And so I was, um, I was mortified with myself and I began a work and that was 40, 42 years ago this fall. And I'm still working. I have, not found a moment where there isn't more work to do. And um, so um, raising two, we, we had later adopted another child and raising two biracial children, I had a front seat for viewing racism, both individual and systemic. Um, there's a quote by James Baldwin that says, to be a Negro in this country and to be relatively conscious is to be in a rage almost all the time. And I discovered that as a parent of these two children, I had occasion for a lot of rage, a lot of growth, but raising these children has, has been a privilege. Um, it seemed that all my friends had blonde children and I grew accustomed to their children being called beautiful and mine being called cute. And I began to learn about the way we value skin and body as white people and what we actually have come to believe about that. All the while I'm growing to the point that to me, black children are beautiful and white children are cute. It didn't take me long to get there. Um, I'm indebted to um, the people who have come along with me on my journey to help me grow, to point things out to me, to, to give me the opportunity to see who I am and who I can become. Um, I'm indebted to people in the 90s in the Knoxville area. Uh, a decade in Blount County, I had a group there that, that met and worked on racism. Uh, Chattanooga, what a blessing. That's a time where, where I was really free to see the world, the diversity of the world. The world is not as white in Chattanooga as it is in the, all the other places in Holston Conference that I've lived. And what a blessing to have um, three precious years and to have colleagues who were willing to um, push me and give me insight. Um, I had a, there was a precious clergyman that I had to convince to trust me because he was black and I was white. And, and that, what a, what a journey that is, to know that he has every reason not to trust me and I desire badly to be trusted. So um, 
I'm grateful for those years, maybe more than any others. And then when coming to Knoxville, back to the white, mostly white world, um, I was blessed to be able to become a part of this group. I had been to some special events and knew it existed. And so I was um, thankfully invited to be a part of it and to have a group of people to journey with. Um, as part of this group, I've read and I'm, I'm, I've relearned history. I hope we all get an opportunity to know that the history we learned in school was not history and that there are real history books uh, that we can read and learn and know the history of the United States and the history of the South and the history of the area we live in which it is never told to us when we're in school. So that's my growing edge today. When I first began hearing um, the word white privilege, um, I knew that word had nothing to do with me. Um, not long ago, a friend of mine, a, a Facebook friend put on Facebook that she was tired of hearing the white privilege thing. And she then began to tell how hard her parents had worked for everything they had, how hard they'd worked to put her through college and how hard she had worked for everything she had. <laughs> um, and you don't get into a discussion about that. I couldn't try to uh, bring any insight to that on Facebook but I understood where she was coming from because I've been there too. Um, I grew up in, um, as I shared last week in, in Russell County, um, I lived on a, a corporate farm that had in previous times, um, a previous century been um, a plantation and the big house, as we uh, were taught to call it, the mansion, the antebellum mansion, um, was built by slaves. The bricks were made by slaves. This was a story that I grew up hearing. Um, and the, the residents of that antebellum mansion in my lifetime were, um, the state senator Harry Stewart, and um, he loved to uh, show off the picture of General J. E. B. Stewart, his uh, ancestor, that was a life size portrait in his house. Um, they were white privilege, um, as I understood the term when I began to hear it. They were white privilege, and I was white poor. My dad was a farmhand, uh, a hireling on their um, hundreds of acres. <laughs> and um, we, we made it possible for um, him to uh, be off in Richmond all the time being a state senator. And um, their, their home was one in which there were servants um, we grew up, I, my house was in the shadow of that house and was a very different kind of house. So white privilege, I, I never understood myself to be privileged in comparison to that. And in comparison to most of the people I grew up with were uh, children of landowners. I was not. Um, my family owned pretty much nothing. So um, when I would hear the term white privilege and it was said that I have white privilege, it, it set up a, a tension within me. And um, I listened to on the, on the General Commission on Religion and Race website, I listened to uh, Robin D'Angelo give a lecture on white privilege. And I found myself in that lecture. Lo and behold, 
I do have white privilege. Um, I learned, as Pat said, that it's not about economics. No, I was not economically privileged. Um, I was just by, very fortunate to um, attend college in a time where the college uh, funds that were granted to me were matched by a government program. That's the only reason I had a college education. It was all gift. Um, I was not privileged enough to go to college, not economically privileged enough. Um, so I began to uh, wrestle with helping my own internal self accept that I, um, I was a part of white privilege. And um, I understood it from two standpoints. Uh, I had two bridges into the concept of white privilege that I was a part of that identified me also. Um, white privilege had to do with the reality that I'm, my skin's the color of the dominant group. Now, when I um, went to seminary, I learned something about male privilege too. Uh, the job uh, that I was promised didn't exist and I went to the office of the lady who had promised it and what she had was an index card box and she would go through and she would say, no, they won't take a woman in that job. No, they won't take a woman in that job. And I, I started a journey that helped me to <laughs> begin to understand that anytime I walked into a pulpit, um, there were going to be people who questioned my worthiness and my right to be there simply because I was a woman, not because of knowing me or hearing me or anything that had to do with any kind of acquaintance, but it was evaluated on my gender. Um, that was a bridge for me to understand that most of my, that all of my uh, friends and colleagues who are not white, um, every day of their lives are evaluated by the color of their skin, that there are, there are places that I can go that doors are wide open and where they have to work their way in. There are things that are given to me that are denied to them simply because of the colors of my skin, their skin. And um, I'm thankful for Robin D'Angelo and the book then that I read, White Fragility, and began to see myself all through that book um, and how blind I had been to some of these concepts throughout my life. Um, so what a blessing it is to begin to open up to understand um, the dynamics that exist, even though I didn't help create them, I have the privilege, have had the privilege. Uh, it's not a privilege I celebrate, but it's a privilege I have to recognize of living within that uh set of standards or as the the book that I recently read the caste system uh, I'm in the caste of persons with white skin and that has given me some open doors some privileges some places of acceptance um, that others who have a different color of skin simply do not have and so um, thank God that we do get the opportunity <laughs> to grow and learn and understand things in a different way throughout our lives. And that that journey of coming to open-mindedness and understanding does not ever end. Um, it hasn't for me and I hope it hasn't for you.